So hello everybody and uh, welcome to today's session on Amazon's approach to high availability deployment. My name is Peter Romensky, I'm a senior manager here at AWS and I spend a lot of my time thinking about how we do deployments and how to do them safely. I work in the developer tool space but I work directly with many of our Amazon service teams to try and figure out how best that they can do their deployments and how they can make changes to their services without causing customer impact. So today I'm going to be talking to you about our approach to eliminating deployment failures. It's a story about how we identify the most important safety practices, how we roll those practices out across a large engineering organization, and then how we take those learnings and build them directly into our tools. So I want to start by getting some definitions out of the way. If we're going to be talking about deployment failure and eliminating deployment failure, it helps to have a crisp definition of what a deployment failure is. Then I want to dive into how we learn from our deployment failures and how we use that learning mechanism to create a roadmap of change. And then we'll dive into the release guidance framework, which allows us to encapsulate those learnings into rules that actually drives change at an organizational scale. We'll then have a look at uh, some of the best practices in depth so you can see some of the deployment practices, that, uh, best practices that we've asked service teams to adopt and we can drill into them in a bit more detail. And then we'll look at some new approaches to doing deployment practices, uh, to, to, to releasing services, uh, service software. It's an approach that reduces the adoption bar for service teams and allows to, uh, gives access to service teams to new features and new capabilities that would otherwise take them much more effort uh, to, to implement. So let's start with kicking off with defining what a deployment failure is and is not. And to do that, let's start with talking about what a deployment is. Now, our definition of a deployment is deliberately much broader than you would ordinarily think of when you hear the word deployment. And the reason for that, I hope, becomes obvious when you sit down and try and create a crisp definition of deployment. You see, uh, the, the line between doing a software release and doing configuration release is very small. And doing an infrastructure code release is just another type of software release, right? And what's the, uh, why count uh, an infrastructure's code release and not count it when a service engineer goes to the infrastructure management tools and makes those changes manually? And so we came to the conclusion, if you follow that line of reasoning to the end, we came to the conclusion that a deployment is any type of service change that a service team makes to their services, any change. It just so happens that a software release through, a, say, a CI CD pipeline, a continuous integration, continuous delivery pipeline, is a very common, frequent type of change. But it's far, it's far from the only type of change that service teams make to their services. And so in that sense, this mechanic here is making a deployment to this car. But let's have a look at some concrete examples of the kinds of things that service teams do that we count as deployments. And so a data migration is a deployment doing a database backfill, adding a column to, uh, adding an index to the column of a database table or doing a, a database failover are all examples of deployments. Scaling your fleet up or scaling your fleet down, doing a configuration change to your service, doing a code release, the more traditional definition of a deployment, or rotating your certificates. These are all examples of things that we consider to be deployments. So what's a deployment failure? So intuitively, this seems obvious. A deployment failure is when a deployment goes wrong, when a change doesn't successfully reach production. But there are cases when a deployment doesn't successfully reach production that don't want to count as a failure in the context of eliminating customer impact. And that's the key point. We're eliminating customer impact. So for example, if a deployment change gets rolled back quickly as a result of early detection of deviation from normal operating conditions, and by doing that rollback, prevents any kind of customer impact. I call that a success, not a failure. And so, to be clear, there's correlation here in the sense that if I do a deployment that doesn't successfully make, reach production, it's more likely to cause customer impact. But what we're aiming for here is the opportunity for service teams to act quickly and safely, and focusing on customer impact provides the lever leverage to do that. So given that definition about customer impact, we have kind of three attributes of a, of a deployment failure for us to consider it a deployment failure. And the first one is duration. If we can cut down the time of a deployment failure 
to be sufficiently small, so small that it doesn't cause any customer impact, then it's not a deployment failure. So it has to last long enough. A deployment failure has to breach the latency and performance contract that a service has with its customers. And a deployment failure has to cause some kind of impact. So despite the fact that a deployment may have been in production for a while, and that we then subsequently roll it back, if it didn't cause any customer impact, we also don't consider that to be a deployment failure. So given those definitions, how do we learn from deployment failures? And the key insight we had about this was that we could take uh, an existing improvement and learning process that was already well established at Amazon and scale it up to work at, at, at the organizational level. And that process is, at its heart, is rooted in the correction of error. And the correction of error, the COE, is something that we've spoken about a number of times before. It's a report that service teams write in response to many types of service events. And the, the service teams don't use this just for their own purposes. They don't just write it to kind of figure out what the root cause of their service was and then to remediate that root cause. They take that correction of error report and they present it at operations meetings and they present it to the broader engineering community so they can learn from the experience that that service team had with that particular event. When, the, when a service team writes a correction of error, they write a number of different sections. And the first part that they write is they write a summary of what happened and, and, the, and the triggering cause of that particular event. They provide some supporting metrics and data in the form of graphs and charts. They provide a statement of what the customer impact was, the types of customers that were impacted, how long they were impacted for. They do a five-wise drill down into the root cause of what, of what triggered the event. Uh, they, they, they take away a number of lessons learned. And then they, importantly, they take a number of corrective actions. And a service team takes these corrective actions and applies it back to the way they operate their service. So let's have a look to see what that looks like in the typical workflow. If we, drew, if we were to draw a flow chart of where the correction of error fits into the life cycle of a, of a, of a customer event, it would look like this. So a service team is operating their service when a customer impacting event happens. And after the service team has mitigated that event and restored customer access to the service, they write the correction of error. And as we just saw, they take a number of COE action items as a result of that, and they apply that back into the way they operate their service. They'll do things like uh, modify the source code of their service to deal with the particular case, potentially, that, uh, that, that happened in this particular event. Or they'll change the way they deploy their software and change the, the way they model and configure their deployments. Or they may change their run books and the way they, they operate their service, changing the, the monitoring, potentially, on the service. These are the kinds of things that service teams do when they take corrective actions. So some of these corrective actions are specific only to that service. But some of the corrective actions that service teams take are more broadly applicable to many services. But this mechanism that we have doesn't have a process of driving change into other service teams. Yes, we have the operations meetings where we share those learnings, but there's no specific mechanism to, to, to actually ensure that service teams are applying those learnings to the way they operate their services. So what we did is we expanded this process. Okay, we wanted to look for a way of expanding this process to work at the operational scale. And what we do now is we take the COE and we review it more deeply. A deployment safety working group reviews every COE and deep dives into all the root causes that are documented in those COEs. And what they're looking for is a way to eliminate not the specific root causes in that COE, but whole classes of root causes. They're looking for opportunities to, to take those learnings to the broader engineering community. And what they're looking for is best practices and tool improvements that service teams can, ad to, can adopt to eliminate those classes of, of, of deployment failure. And so uh, the kinds of tool improvements we're looking for are the ones that make the best practice adoption easier. Maybe we're removing some sharp edges in the deployment tools. Maybe we're changing the defaults of the, the deployment tools to kind of make them safe out of the box, safe by default. So if we zoom up on that and look at this at an organizational level, what we're looking at here is a number of service teams now at some point having some kind of customer impacting event that creates a COE that's reviewed by the, the, the deployment safety working group uh, that creates a number of best practices and tool improvements. And mechanistically, what the, what the deployment safety working group is doing is that they're tagging the COEs with these best practices and tool improvements. And over time, what happens is that we accumulate uh, certain best practices and tool improvements that bubble to the top of the priority list because they happen more often than others. 
And by bubbling these things to the top of the priority list, we're creating a roadmap of change that we want at some point to drive into the other service teams. And so um, if we look at our definition of what a deployment, uh, a deployment failure was, it turns out that we have three levers that we can use when we're curating and assigning these tags to the COEs. We can look for opportunities to prevent. So we're looking for best practices and tool improvements that can outright prevent a particular event from happening in the first place. Or we can look for ways that we can mitigate the event by making it much shorter, so short that it doesn't cause any customer impact, or much smaller, so small that it doesn't cause any customer impact. So now we have this roadmap of tags that says, hey, these are the things that we should be driving across the organization, but how do we actually drive that across the organization? And this is where the release guidance framework comes in. The release guidance framework is a set of processes and tools that we use to notify, motivate, educate, and enforce these best practices across a large engineering organization at scale. Now, before we drive into the release guidance process in detail, what I want to do is just touch on a couple of cultural elements of how Amazon service teams operate here at AWS. And the first one, which you've probably heard a lot of talk about, is the two pizza team, so-called because engineering teams are no bigger than can be fed with two pizzas. That typically makes them around eight to 10 engineers in size. And what's true about these teams is that they operate very independently and autonomously. We, we think about them as being like a, a federation of startups uh, in some respects. And so what that means is that we have this decentralized ownership model where service teams own the software development lifecycle that they want to use, they own the product roadmap they want to they deliver, they own uh, the, the software stack that they want to run on, uh, the, the languages and frameworks that they want to use to develop their services, and they make local process decisions. And so this initially looks like a very hard cultural environment in which to try and drive large amounts of organizational change. But there are two aspects to the way we operate our, uh, our service teams that significantly increase our chances of success. And the first one of those is the fact that service teams run with consistent operational standards across all the service teams. And this is driven in part by the correction of error process that we have and the fact that we take these correction of errors to, to these operations meetings where we all share our learnings and we share our approach and, and we share our operational stories. And it's also driven by the operational readiness review process that service teams go through uh, in, in order to launch, uh, but prior to launching a new feature or a new, or a new service. The other thing that, that, that increases our chance of success is the fact that service teams largely use identical tools and platforms uh, w when, they're, when they're operating their services. They use the same tools for deployment and for deployment orchestration, for example. And that allows us a single set of tools to target best practices against and a single set of tools to audit to determine whether they're actually adopting those best practices. The other element of culture that I want to talk about is just the scale of the organization. So when we often talk about DevOps, we talk about it at the single service team level. This service team is maybe operating 10 or 20 services, and at that scale, a service team can make their own process decisions and, 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 and make their own learnings about best practice and apply them to themselves. If we scale that up a bit, we get six service teams. Maybe these service teams have dependencies on each other, but they may also be running on different frameworks and languages, but largely they're probably all using the same tooling and they can talk amongst themselves and coordinate their best practices. As we continue to scale this up, this gets harder and harder. And at, at a large scale, it becomes impossible for service teams to coordinate with each other directly in order to agree on what the best practices are. And so the question we want to answer is, how do we continually raise the safety bar across thousands of teams, tens of thousands of software services, and hundreds of thousands of deployments per month? And the answer to that is we use, we use the release guidance framework. And this re, uh, release guidance lifecycle is, is, is based on analysis of the structure of service teams, continuous integration, and continuous delivery pipelines. The CICD pipeline models most aspects of how a service team uh, launches services to production, from, from committing the code into the repository to having it built to testing it through some kind of integration test and then rolling it out across the regions in which that service operates. And what we do is we audit the configuration and structure of how that release is modeled. And we take that auditing data and we pass it into a set of rules. And it's at the rules that we map our learnings from our tagging 
into, into something that's actionable in the release guidance, in the, in the release guidance lifecycle. There's one rule for each high priority tag that we identified in the deployment safety working group. So for example, we have identified the fact that all service teams should, integra uh, should implement an integration test. That was one of the tags that we identified early on while we were tagging COEs, is that service teams that didn't model an integration test well uh, had, more, had more customer impact. And so we have a rule that says you must have an integration test. The output of the rule then drives the enforcement process. And the enforcement process drives its enforcement against the pipeline, closing that circle. And what we mean by enforcement is that we quarantine the pipeline. We disable it. We turn it off. Service teams can no longer promote anything through that pipeline anymore. They can't even get it to beta. They can't get it to production at all. And so that provides immediate and direct feedback to the service team that they have a risk in the way they've modeled their release. And they need to take immediate and urgent action to remediate that situation and, and adopt the best practice that we're asking them to adopt. And this is the process by which we can drive change at the, at the organizational scale. So what I want to do now is step into each one of these steps in a little bit more detail so you can see a little bit more about how it works. And the first step is the audit. And so what you see on the screen here is um, a logical model of what a CRCD pipeline might look like. In fact, this pipeline already implements some of the best practices that we're asking service teams to adopt. Uh, for example, it has a pre-prod wave and a canary wave. And I'll describe those in a bit more detail later in the talk. Structurally, the, the pipeline moves from left to right. And as we move through the pipeline, we promote through the wave. So we start with build and then move to alpha and then beta and all the way through into our production waves, wave one and wave two, where we see that we're deploying into, into the, our first production regions, US West one, US East one, AP South one. In the left part of the pipeline, you can see that we model integration tests. They're the green boxes. Well, we, we, we model testing more generally. So you can see attached to the build wave is a unit test. Uh, to the, the beta wave, we have integration testing and load testing. At the pre-prod wave, we have regional configuration tests. And I'll be describing that in a little bit more detail as well. So what the audit does is it drills into all aspects of the pipeline. And it takes this modeling and configuration data, and it passes it to the rules. The blue boxes that you see inside the waves, they're the actual deployment targets. They represent the fleets onto which we're actually going to deploy the software. And I want to drill into US West 1 as an example. So here's US West 1. This is the deployment. This is the deployment configuration that we model for, for, for our deployment tool. And so what we model is we model the, a, a rollback alarm. A rollback alarm is used by the deployment tool, and it continuously monitors the alarm to see if any of those alarms trigger during the deployment. If they do, we immediately stop the deployment and start rolling each instance back to the previous revision. It models the health constraints and velocity constraints. How quickly can we deploy across our fleet? It models the load balancer, and it models the capacity, the instances onto which we want to deploy the software. Now, the, the deployment tool actually controls the instance lifecycle in that load balancer. And so during the deployment, it will pull an instance from the load balancer, put the new revisions of software on, and then put that instance back into the load balancer. So all of this configuration makes up part of the audit information that we pass on to the rule. OK, so the rules themselves are implemented as lambdas. So each rule is a lambda, takes the audit data, outputs what we call a recommendation that's consumed by the enforcement process. If the recommendation says you should enforce, then the enforcement happens. But when we launch a rule, we launch a rule at a specific part in the organizational structure. So this VP, for example, is an organization that may be ready and able to adopt a rule across their org. We only want to launch rules into organizations that are ready and able to adopt that rule and for which that rule is important. Uh, so other organizations may not be ready, and we won't initially launch the rule there. But service teams that want to adopt their own special rules can do so. So this particular organization may have a particular architecture or, or particular operational practice that they want to make sure is enforced across their organization. And they can write their own rule, because rule authoring is self-service, and we can federate that out to the service teams if they want to. The other thing that we do is when we want to launch a new rule uh, at a very wide scale, we will start small. We will start at an individual service team, and we'll try the rule out there, and we'll get some feedback for how well that rule is working. And once we get the feedback and we make the adjustments that we want to make to the rule and tune it to work correctly, then we'll start growing it up through the organizational tree, 
uh, and, and, and expand, expand its role out until it's covering the entire organization. When we launch a rule, we launch it at a particular date. And what that means, it, uh, it only enforces things from, that are created from that day forward. So it allows us to stop the bleeding. It allows us to prevent the introduction of any net new risks from that day forward. Any pipeline that is created from that date is quarantined. And so they can't do any deployments with it. What it also does is it allows service teams to continue operating the services that they were already uh, operating without inter interruption, right? And so it doesn't immediately block everybody. But what it does do is it surfaces those, those deployment safety risks in their deployment tools and in our policy, in our policy, uh, um, policy reporting tools. And then service teams are given a certain amount of time in order to go back to the existing pipelines and apply uh, and, and, build, uh, and build into their roadmap enough time to go, uh, go and adjust uh, the, configuration, excuse me, the configuration of those pipelines to adopt the deployment safety practices that we want them to adopt. Okay, so uh, at some point in the future, though, we've said, okay, well, you should have had enough time now to adopt all those safety practices. We're going to turn on enforcement across every pipeline. And then any pipeline that still has any open risks also gets quarantined. And so then the service team gets the, gets the feedback because their pipeline doesn't work anymore. They have to go and make changes. But there are cases when service teams can't immediately make the change that we ask them to. They may have other critical priorities, or maybe the rule just doesn't apply to them. And so we have a number of ways of dealing with the real world. And the first one of those is that service teams can break glass. And what we mean by that is they can re-enable the pipeline. They can break the quarantine. And they can do that at any time. We never want to get in the way of a service team wanting, needing to make critical operational changes to their services. If they need to make a change to, to protect their customer's experience, we need to be able to let them do that. Uh, the consequence of breaking glass is that your leadership gets an email saying, hey, this pipeline has just re reintroduced a number of really critical deployment safety uh, risks, and you should be aware of that. And the break glass only lasts for a day. Tomorrow morning, it's going to be re-quarantined. And so it's a mechanism which means that we don't get in the way, but we also still provide a significant amount of friction for service teams, so they're still motivated to make the changes that we want them to make. Service teams can request an exemption. So the most common use case for this is a service team may be implementing a deployment safety practice in another way, a way that's not directly modeled in the pipeline so we can't detect it. This is pretty rare, but it does happen. So uh, using integration testing as an, as, as an example again, service teams may have implemented the integration test outside of their pipeline because of the testing tools that they're using, they can't, they can't implement it in the pipeline or because of the architecture of their software needs to be uh, tested in a particular way. And so the test is not modeled in their pipeline. It's modeled outside of their pipeline. We didn't detect it, so they request an exemption. They get that exemption approved. And that pipeline, for that particular rule, doesn't need to, need to comply anymore. For all the other rules, it's still, it's, still required. So you, it's still required to comply. So you need to request an exemption on a per-rule basis. And the last thing that service teams can do is they can reclassify their pipeline. We think of pipelines as being either customer impacting or non-customer impacting. And by customer impacting, we mean if I do do a deployment to this pipeline, does it have the opportunity to cause customer impact? It doesn't necessarily mean that that, that service is taking direct customer traffic, uh, but the, the deployment to that pipeline could cause customer impact because it makes changes to configuration or to, or to a database or something like that. Um, on, the, on the flip side, there's a number of pipelines that we consider non-customer impacting. These things might be um, a test pipeline that we've, that we've stood up to, to do a specific type of corner case testing, or we might be doing an experiment uh, on, on our service to, to change the algorithm in some way to improve its performance or latency characteristics. Or it may just be an operational tool that we use internally, and we roll this software out uh, fairly regularly, and we stood up a pipeline for it. None of these things are customer impacting. So service teams can reclassify those pipelines. And if they classify them as non-customer impacting, then they're opted out of all rules, and, they, and they, don't need to, they don't need to be held to the same operational bar. So let's have a look at some examples of some of the deployment practices that we've asked service teams to adopt. And we've spoken about this a few times. Let's start with integration tests. So integration tests, we expect all service teams to implement and model integration tests in their pipelines. And an integration test is characterized by a test fleet that drives traffic against the beta endpoint 
And behind that endpoint is a beta fleet, and that beta fleet has only beta dependencies. So the dependencies that the, that, the, that the service team has that are beta dependencies are the ones that are in the envelope of that service team's responsibility. So if a service team uh, is, is using DynamoDB and S3 uh, for, for some of its components, it's not going to hit the beta endpoints of those services. It's using the production endpoints. It's hitting the beta endpoints of the services that that service team is building. And that allows us to drive a, bunch of, uh, a number of integration tests against that endpoint to test the service as though it was running on, on, a, on a fleet. And it allows us to do a, a fairly comprehensive set of tests to make sure that it's, it's running correctly. And this is a key operational practice that we found to be very effective at ensuring that a software uh, is not going to cause any customer impact once it hits production. The next thing we ask service teams to do is what's called a pre-production pre testing. This is similar in some respects to integration testing, but it has some important differences. And so again, we have, we have a test fleet. And this test fleet uh, we call the regional configuration test fleet. This test fleet is running a number of integration tests against a pre-production endpoint. And that, behind that endpoint sits a pre-production fleet. The pre-production fleet only has production dependencies. Okay, so we're hitting this fleet with test traffic, but this fleet has only production dependencies. And what we're testing here is to make sure that all the configuration that we're about to roll out to production is configured correctly. All the endpoints, all our dependency endpoints are correct, all the credentials that we need, the like database credentials and, and, um, and, and service endpoint credentials that we need are correct, any certificates that are required on the instance are correct, all the other configuration that we need to run in production are correct. That's the purpose of this test. And we expect service teams to do this, on a, to run this on a per region basis. So if you roll out to US East 1, you have one, you, have, you do a pre-production test. If you roll out to US West 1, you have another uh, pre-production test. The next thing we expect service teams to do is to have a canary deployment. A canary deployment is a deployment to a single instance of a production fleet. We're now deploying to production. And so the instances here are now taking production traffic. And the purpose of the canary deployment is to limit, is to limit the impact of the production deployment in the production fleet. Because we're only deploying to one instance, only one instance is taking production traffic. So in this case, we have five instances in our fleet. So only 20% of the traffic is going to be hitting this because the load balancer is distributing the load evenly across the fleet. Only 20% of production requests are being served by the Canary instance. So it limits any potential impact of a bad deployment to 20% of requests. To be a conforming Canary deployment, we expect it to have a rollback alarm. A rollback alarm is alarming on its dependencies, it's alarming on its instance metrics and on-host runtime metrics, it's alarming on its uh, uh, load balancer metrics, and it's alarming on synthetic traffic metrics. And I'll talk about synthetic traffic in a moment. So after, after, uh, after a canary deployment comes the deployment to the production fleet. And there are some parts of the production fleet that we also, we also uh, look into the configuration of to make sure that, there are, that, that you're complying with two particular rules. One is that you're driving synthetic traffic against your production endpoints. Or pr uh, public endpoints for AWS services have synthetic traffic being driven against them. And we also make sure that you have a rollback alarm associated with your deployment. And so the synthetic traffic is important for two reasons. The first reason is that you may be doing a deployment at a time when there isn't a lot of traffic. It may be because you've just launched a new region and you don't have a lot of customers yet. It may be because you're just deploying at a time when there isn't a lot of customer traffic. So you want to make sure that there's some traffic being driven against your, against your service so that you can validate that, the, that during the deployment, uh, the rollback alarm has some signal to, 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 to roll back against. We also want to make sure that you can alarm on your customer's experience. The synthetic traffic is using the same uh, CLIs and APIs as your customers and allows you to create metrics from your synthetic traffic instances so that you can alarm on your customer's experience. And so the other rule that we drive is that we ask you to have, we ask all service teams to model a rollback alarm. And very similar to the Canary instance, this rollback alarm is wired into your dependencies, into your instance metrics, into your on-host runtime metrics, into your um, production metrics, oh, sorry, into your load balancer metrics, and into your synthetic traffic. So if we come back to the pipeline that we were looking at before as a slightly modified version, what we just looked at 
is the highlighted portion of this pipeline. So we had a beta wave that had integration tests deploying to a beta fleet. We had a pre-prod wave with regional configuration tests deploying to a pre-prod fleet, a canary wave with soak tests, and a wave one, a production wave, being driven by synthetic traffic. So just a quick call out about the soak tests. We want, to, we want to park at the, to have a conforming canary deployment, we want to make sure that we soak at the canary deployment for a sufficient amount of time. We don't just want to deploy it and move on quickly. And you know, a, a primitive way of doing that is to say, let's bake for three hours, say. But what we actually want service teams to do is to bake for a certain number of requests. So we say bake for 100,000 requests, and not until we've, ha we've served 100,000 requests do we want to promote from the, ca from the canary wave into wave one. And what that allows us to do is to compensate for when there's periods of low traffic or we've deployed into a region with not as many customers, we, we can then make sure that we get sufficient amount of traffic so that we're pretty sure that all corner cases and use cases have been covered. So as we've thought about how service teams are modeling these best practices in the pipeline, and we've thought about you know, the amount of effort that it takes service teams to adopt these best practices, and the kind of the future directions we'd like to go, it occurred to us that we could actually incorporate most of those best practices that we just looked at directly into our deployment tools. And by doing that, we can significantly lower the cost of adoption. And at the same time, we can provide a number of, uh, a number of features to service, service teams that would otherwise be very hard for those service teams to implement themselves. And so I want to talk about some of these new approaches in the, next, in the, in the last part of the talk. And the first one I want to talk about is the idea of fractional deployments. A fractional deployment is a generalization of a canary deployment. It, it, it takes the idea of a canary deployment but wants to improve it on a number of dimensions. And I'm going to talk about those dimensions uh, over the next few slides. And so what we're looking at here is the area of the, of the pipeline that's encapsulated in this red box. And in that red box, we have the pre-prod wave, the canary wave, and the production wave. And what we found is we can collapse all of that, all of those sections of the pipeline, down into the deployment tool, down into the box that says US West 1. All of those features can be collapsed down into there. And this is a section of the pipeline that's been, that is being repeated for every production wave. We expect every production wave to have a pre-prod, every production wave to have a canary deployment. So by doing that, not only are we lowering the barrier to adoption, we're actually simplifying kind of the cognitive overhead uh, and, and the maintenance effort to maintain a very long pipeline. We, we're shrinking it quite substantially. So let's have a look um, at, the, at what US West 1 looks like and, and motivate uh, some of our capability of, of actually implementing this in the deployment tool. So the key thing here is that we model the load balancer, and we're already controlling the instance lifecycle into and out of the load balancer as we're doing the deployment. And so the idea is we can do more with that, right? We're already talking to the load balancer. That means we can, we can actually ask the load balancer to do other things, and that's, the, that's what we want to look at in the next few slides. So I've got a number of animations here that, that will hopefully make this uh, clearer about what's going on. The key thing to understand is that this is all being orchestrated in the deployment tool now and not at the pipeline level. And we're going to start off by looking at what the canary deployment looks like orchestrated from within the deployment tool. So we've got the deployment, uh, we've got the fleet being served by serving uh, production traffic, and then the deployment kicks off and it pulls the first instance, the canary instance from the load balancer, and deploys the green revision of software to that instance and then puts that instance back into the load balancer again. Now we're driving produ uh, production traffic there and we're actually doing the soak test. We're actually counting the number of requests and once we hit the correct number of requests, we can progress with the deployment and deploy the next three instances. Okay, we've finished with the canary deployment now and because the minimum health constraint, the velocity constraint on this particular fleet says that we have to maintain a minimum health of 60%, we can actually deploy more than one instance at a time. So after we finish the first three, uh, the next three instances, we can deploy the next two instances and, and upgrade them, uh, deploy the green re revision of software there, and then we can do the last two instances. And all this while, production traffic is hitting the production fleet. There's no interruption to services to customers as we're rolling out the next revision of software. And once we've finished, the, the fleet is now serving all production traffic. So that's what a canary deployment would look like. But the canary deployment might go wrong so let's have a look to see what would happen in a rollback case of, of, of running a canary deployment. 
Okay, so we kick off again with the production traffic hitting uh, the fleet running the blue revision. We pull the canary instance from the load balancer. We deploy the green revision of software. We put the canary instance back into the load balancer. And then we start the soak test. But now during the soak test, something goes wrong. There's a defect. There's a regression in this particular revision of software, which is marked by the fact that the box around the instance has now gone red. The rollback alarm is fired, so the deployment tool pulls the instance from the load balancer, rolls the software back to the blue revision of software, and then puts the instance back into the load balancer again. So at this point, we've rolled back the service, and it's now running on the blue, uh, back on the blue revision, and the customer, um, and the customer, or, or customer impact has been removed. In fact, as soon as we pulled the instance from the load balancer, before we even managed to roll back the software on that instance, full, full. Um, uh, the, 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 any kind of uh, issue that was caused to the customer has been remediated because uh, as soon as the load balancer can't send traffic to that instance anymore, we've actually fixed the issue, right? All, all requests are now being served by the previous revision of software. Okay, so that's great. We have, we have now achieved a canary deployment. Um, and we, um, and we've, we've lowered the barrier to adoption. And so service teams are happy. They can, they, can, they can apply canary deployments without needing to model an extra deployment target and an extra pipeline stage and so forth and, and model the, and, and model the, um, the, the soak test uh, in, uh, uh, metrics count. But we haven't actually added any new functionality yet. Yes, we've, we've, we've reduced the barrier to adoption, but we'd like to actually create, uh, add some more functionality. And what we're going to do next is look at the idea of traffic shifting deployments. And so the key interesting thing about this is that a canary deployment can only reduce the customer impact based on the number of instances that are in the fleet. So in this case, we have eight instances in our fleet. And when we do the canary deployment, we can, we, we've limited the amount of impact to 12.5% of the requests that are coming to that fleet. But that's still 12.5% of requests. And we can do better than that. In fact, we can dive that down to 1% or half a percent of requests. Right? And the way we do that is that we adjust the weights in the load balancer so that less traffic gets sent to the canary instance. So let's have a look at that. And so we start again with the, the blue revision of software taking all the traffic. We pull the canary instance from the load balancer. We deploy the green revision of software. And now when we put the canary instance back into the load balancer, we adjust the weights in the load balancer so it sends only 1% of traffic to that load balancer. And the rest of the fleet is now taking a much higher proportion of traffic. As we gain confidence in this and the rollback alarm doesn't fire, we continue to adjust the weights in the load balancer to drive more and more traffic to the, load to, to the canary instance. So we might start at 1% and then go to 2% and then go to 5% and then go to 12.5% or 10%. And eventually, we'll get back to the, same, to, to the level of entitlement as the rest of the fleet. But we don't have to stop there. Right? What we can do is we can now drive up the traffic against that instance and start doing a load test against the canary instance by overloading the, 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 the traffic, by adjusting the weights further and driving more traffic to the canary instance until it takes, by default, 50% more traffic than it was taking before. And the reason we, we, we send 50% more traffic is if you think about your production fleet and it's spanning across three availability zones, if we were to lose an availability zone, then the traffic on the other two availability zones would go up by 50%. So we always want to make sure that any instance can take 50% 50 50 more traffic than it's currently taking. So that allows us to do a traffic shifting canary deployment and a traffic shifting load test and add that into the, into the feature bag that we're providing to customers, to our customers. So the next thing we want to look at is modeling the pre-production test. So no need to model the pre-production test in, in, the, in the pipeline anymore. We can implement that here. And the key thing about the pre-production test, if you remember back to our diagram, is that it has all production dependencies. Well, the Canary instance is part of the production fleet, so it already has all production dependencies. But what we want to do is we want to drive test traffic there. And what we're going to do is we're going to orchestrate the creation of a load balancer during the deployment. And so we start off by driving production traffic to our, blue, uh, our, our, our production fleet. We pull the Canary instance from the load balancer. And now what we do is we spin up a new load balancer. 
and we put the canary instance behind this new bal no load balancer that's behind a new test endpoint, and then we tell the test uh, orchestration system to start driving tests at this new endpoint. And now we're driving integration tests against our Canary instance that has all production dependencies, so now we're doing a pre-production deployment. Once that the tests have all passed, we pull the instance from that load balancer, spin that load balancer back down, and then add the Canary instance back into the production fleet. And now we've finished our pre-production deployment. And we flow directly into, into the da traffic shifting Canary deployment and then into the traffic shifting load test. So we can now orchestrate this whole thing end to end all in a way that's uh, kind of built into our deployment tools and it's very easy for service teams to adopt. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about is an anomaly detection. And so the insight we had here was that service teams had a number of monitoring misses uh, during their deployments. And by creating, uh, for certain classes of metrics, if we attach an automatic anomaly detection, uh, detector to those metrics, we can automate the creation of rollback alarms for service teams. And so what we're looking at here is the, the, the diagram that we were looking at before that was modeling the deployment to the production fleet. And, and as we mentioned before, we've got the rollback alarm that's, taking, that's looking at metrics from dependencies, looking at metrics from, from our instance metrics, from our on-time runtime metrics, from our, from our load balancer, and from our synthetic traffic. But even with all this monitoring, things can go wrong. And so what we're looking at here is the fact that the rollback alarm is getting no signal despite the fact that customers are now having a degraded experience and the fleet is in an unhealthy state. So what can we do about that? So the insight we had was that during our, our, our COE analysis, the Deployment Safety Working Group was, was developing tags that noticed that there were certain classes of metrics that were highly correlated with customer impact. And if we could attach anomaly detectors to those particular classes of metrics, then we could provide out of the box a, a rollback capability for service teams without them having to configure that. And the first set of metrics we call the standard service metrics. This is the fault rate, this is the HTTP 500 return codes, uh, the error rate, which is the HTTP 400 return codes, and the traffic metrics, like traffic volume and traffic latency. The next set are the standard instance metrics, the CPU metrics, the disk utilization, the memory utilization metrics, and the last set are the standard runtime metrics, heap utilization, so JVM heap utilization, for example, garbage collect collection metrics and thread metrics. And by attaching anomaly detectors to these metrics, we can create uh, a, an automatic onboarding for service teams to that, uh, for, for them. And so what we do when the but prior to the deployment starting is that we, we look at the three hours prior to the deployment and we look at the metrics generated during those three hours and we train our anomaly detector. And so what we're looking at here is the error count anomaly detector, it's the 400 return codes. And, our tr and what, we, what we use is we use heuristic anomaly detectors. And so these heuristic anomaly detectors are based on our understanding for how these metrics should, should, should work and how those metrics should kind of look before a deployment and how those metrics should behave during a deployment. And so in this case, we train our anomaly detector by calculating the average, which is 16.4 errors per minute, and a standard deviation of 21.1. And then what happens is that we continue to consume that metric during the deployment. And we look to see how that metric is behaving while the deployment is ongoing. And the red vertical line here represents when the deployment started. And so you can see that after the deployment started, the, 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 this metric behaves quite differently. And if we zoom in on that, we can see that the behavior of the metric is, is significantly deviates from the way it behaved before the deployment. And what we're looking for is to see if this metric breaches some kind of threshold. And the threshold, in this case, is marked by the yellow line and is the average plus three times the standard deviation. And our, our anomaly detector here says, if we breach this threshold, for five or more data points, then that's considered, uh, that's considered a breach of, of, of the rollback, uh, the, the anomaly detector, and we trigger a rollback. Okay, and so in this case, that is exactly what happened for this particular metric, and a rollback was triggered. In the next example, we have an anomaly detector called the sustained traffic drop detector. In this case, uh, we're looking at the three hours prior to the deployment, which starts at the first red line, and the second red line represents the end of the deployment. And so you can see prior to the deployment starting, 
the, the traffic volume was about four requests per minute. And then the deployment starts, and you can see shortly after the deployment starts that the traffic volume starts to decrease. And, and towards the end of the deployment, the traffic metric goes away completely. And at this point, we've lost all traffic, so something serious has gone wrong, and we, we roll back this deployment. Anomaly detection doesn't have to only, it isn't necessarily dependent on just one anomaly detector. Now, the rollback can be triggered because of a combination of anomaly scores. And so in this case, it required two different anomaly detectors to get close to firing in order to actually trigger the, the rollback. The first metric that we were watching was the traffic, the traffic volume metric. In this case, the three hours prior to the deployment, we were getting about 10,000 requests per minute. Shortly after the deployment started, it bumped up to 14,000 requests per minute. This wasn't sufficient to, to fire the rollback alarm by itself, but at the same time, the JVM heap utilization metric also spiked. So prior to the three hours, it was, it was low, and then shortly after the deployment, it also spiked up. Neither of these metrics by themselves was sufficient to trigger the rollback, but in combination, their anomaly scores added together caused the rollback. And the last example I want to talk about is the fault spike anomaly detector. And in this case, the three hours prior to the deployment, so this is the HTTP 500 error return code, so it indicates a server-side error. And the three hours prior to the deployment, this metric was pretty much at zero with a couple of blips. And then the deployment starts, and shortly after the deployment starts, we had a significant spike in the fault rate. And then shortly thereafter, another spike. And so those spikes in the fault rate were sufficient to also trigger a rollback, and, and the deployment was rolled back. And so our, our ability to uh, implement these anomaly detectors is made possible by the fact that the service teams are using a consistent a set of deployment tools into which we can build these anomaly detectors. And they're using the same uh, metric system, and they're using the same alarming system, and that allows us to, 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 to build this uh, anomaly detection system and build it into our tools automatically. And the service teams don't need to configure anything, and they don't need to opt into anything, it just it comes out of the box. And we've applied this to, to, to at the organizational level in a similar way to the way we apply rules. So that brings me to kind of the, the end, of, end of my talk. I just need to call out that, um, there's a, that we offer DevOps training and certification online. Uh, go and check that out. Uh, thank you very much for attending. I hope that uh, you were able to learn something from, about how we do this. <laughs>